Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. We're going to study this morning out of the Gospel of John. John chapter... Every time I read the Bible, I say, man, that's a beautiful chapter. <laughs> it's because every chapter in there is. I get, God just reveals so much in his word. I want to ask one of you if you'd stand and open us in prayer. doesn't matter who. Father, again, we do lift our voices to you, our thanksgiving, our prayers, thanking you for that salvation that freely given to us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanking you for the many blessings in our lives each day, Lord. We pray now that you would join with us, teach us, guide us, open our spiritual hearts and our eyes, Lord, to the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the gracious love that you have for each and every one of us, in spite of who we are and what we are, Lord. Oh, how you love us. I also pray for those less fortunate than we are. All these things I pray for in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. There is one scripture in John 21 that tells us how blessed we are. And when we get, when we get to it, I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. In fact, you should know it. But in case you don't, <laughs> In case you don't, I'm going to definitely make you aware of it. I want to bless those that's joining with us over the Internet, those listening over Crusade Radio, and each and every one of you that's here. I pray God would allow me to bless you in this day with his word, with his word, not my word, with his word. I'm going to start at the last few verses of chapter 20. Starting in verse 21, I mean 24. Because many of us in our lives, some of us today, are like Thomas, doubting. That's where the world gets doubting Thomas from. Because one of Jesus' disciples was a doubter. That was Thomas. Starting in verse 24. This is the second appearance of Jesus Christ after the resurrection. The first time he appeared in the upper prayer room, you remember when he came out of the grave, he told Mary Magdalene, run down there and tell them disciples, if they remember what I told them before I was crucified, I told them I would meet them in Galilee. He said, now run down there and tell them I'll meet them in Galilee. So when they all got together in that upper prayer room, Jesus appeared in the upper prayer room the first time. But the first time he appeared, Thomas wasn't there. Thomas was one of the disciples that wasn't there the first time. So when the, when the disciples went and told Thomas that they had seen the Lord, Thomas didn't believe him. Thomas said, no, I don't believe it. That's why doubting Thomas comes in. This is the second time that Jesus appeared. And many of us will say that 
God is coming to our heart and into our life, and people around you don't believe it. They are doubters. They are doubters. And many of us, God says in his word, to as many as believe on him, on the name of Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. And Jesus says, ask the Father anything in my name, and it shall be given unto you. And many of us are doubters. We ask God something in the name of Jesus Christ, then we get up and think we got to help God do it. God don't need no help, but you're a doubter. Doubting, we are just like doubting Thomas. Starting at verse 24 of chapter 20. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and put my hand in his side, I ain't going to believe it. <laughs> I ain't going to believe it. Thomas, they came and told Thomas, we seen the Lord. Thomas said, if I'll put my, hand, my hands in them holes where them nails was, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within. They was in the upper prayer room again. And Thomas, this time, Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus. See, God is in our lives whether we want him in there or not. But you've got to recognize when he's there. You know, since I came to give myself over to the Lord, I can look back in my sinful life, and I know every time God was there. Every time. Because I could say, if it wasn't for the Lord, I wouldn't have got through that. But in the, at that time when he was there, I didn't recognize him. Same as Thomas. I was a doubter then. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, that's when we don't want to let God in. God is there whether we want to let him in or not. We have the door shut. There's some here and some listening over the internet have not invited Jesus Christ in their heart and into their lives. Whether they want him in it or not, he's in control. You just haven't opened the door and let him in. But here it says, Jesus was there and the doors were shut. And he stood in the midst of them. And he said, peace unto you. Then he said unto Thomas. Then he, he because Jesus know you. Then he said unto Thomas. You don't want to believe I'm in control of your life? Just touch me. Just touch Touch me. There's a scripture in the Bible where God says, in the book of Malachi, try me and see if I won't do what I told you I'd do. Just try me. Jesus told Thomas, touch me. Go ahead. Stick your hand in these holes and stick your hand in my side. I am he. I am he. Then said he unto Thomas, reach here your, your finger and behold my hands and reach here your hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believe. Try me a little bit, but don't try me wavering in doubt because the Bible teaches you if you ask God anything and you're doubting, he's not going to give it to you. But he said, don't try me faithless. Have faith. When you ask for something, have faith. God's going to do it. Almost 20 years ago, I got on my knees with, a, with an addiction, a cocaine addiction. I tried God. I had faith. Almost 20 years clean now. 
I didn't go faithless. AA couldn't do it. Penitentiary couldn't do it. God did. Because I asked him in faith, Lord, help me. In faith. And then Thomas said, then when you try God, and you find out God does everything that he says, because there's not a promise in this Bible that God will not keep. Not one. And every one of these promises in here is for each and every one of us, because we are his creation. And God don't want to see his creation fail. And Thomas said unto him, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him. Now this is where our blessing comes in. Jesus said unto him. Thomas. Because you have seen me. Is that the only reason why you believe? Because you have seen me. None of us. I'm glad I didn't walk around when Jesus Christ was alive. You know that? Because I might have had doubt too. I might have been just like Thomas. There were a lot of doubting people walking around during the time of Jesus Christ. Many people don't go to God unless they, he gets some, they get something from him. You notice there were ten lepers that went to Jesus Christ and they all wanted something. They all wanted to be healed. But when they got what they wanted, they all ran, all except for one. Only one came back. I would have hated to have been there and seen the miracles that Jesus did and still not believe. Still not believe. But do you know there was one guy in the Bible that didn't see Jesus and he believed? One blind guy. Never saw Jesus. Never, saw, never even laid his eyes on Jesus. But he believed. But you know something else about that blind guy? He didn't get that miracle performed on him until he obeyed. Jesus said to him, Jesus took that mud and put it on his eyes and told him, go to the pool called Sent and wash. If he didn't go and obey, he just would have been standing there with mud on his eyes. He never would have saw. But he went and he washed and he obeyed. And they asked him, who healed you? He said, I don't know. But I believe in him now. All I know is I was once blind, but now I see. But I don't know who it was that healed me. I have not seen Jesus just like that blind man. But yet I believe. Yet I believe. He asked Thomas, just because you've seen me now, now you believe? Blessed are they that believe and have not seen. That's where our blessings come in. Blessed are they that believe and have not seen. Yet, without seeing me, they still believe. They still believe. Believe. Verse 30, John 20. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book. I can imagine there were so many miracles that Jesus performed, they couldn't write them all down, or, or we'd have, we wouldn't have a, a Bible, we'd have a book of miracles. <laughs> all the miracles Jesus performed. Because if you remember, when he fed the 5,000, he healed a lot of people too. He couldn't put down all the miracles that he did. Say, but these things are written. These things are written about Thomas doubting, putting us in our place, letting us know how many, how many of us are doubters. These things are written so that you might believe on Jesus. Without seeing it. Without seeing it. 
that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Through his name. Because believe me, if, if you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart and in your life, you don't know what living is. What does the Bible teach you? You're not alive. If you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are not alive. Because the Bible teaches you, you are born dead in your sin. Even though you're walking around breathing, you are dead in your sin. Until Jesus Christ comes into your heart and into your life, then you are born. That's why it says born again. Because you're born the first time into death. You're born the first time a sinner. But when you put on Jesus Christ, you are born again. Then you see life. Because if you don't die in this life, you will die in the next one. You will definitely die in the next life. John chapter 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And this is the way that he showed himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples, which probably was John and James. Simon said unto them, I'm going fishing. <laughs> Simon said, I'm going fishing. He already seen the Lord. And Simon said, I know it, I'm going, I'm going fishing. In Matthew chapter 28, the last thing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ tells us to do is go out and preach to all nations. That's a going fishing. That don't mean you got to catch a plane and go over to Iran and catch a boat and go over here. That means there are a lot of people in your lives of different colors, different races that need to hear the gospel. And when you run into them, speak it. Speak it. That's fishing. That's fishing. Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. They said unto him, well, we're going with you. And they went forth and entered into the ship immediately. And that, that night they caught nothing. Now there's a reason why they didn't catch nothing. There's a reason why we don't catch people too. But you know what the Bible says? I can do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthens me. When you go out there trying to bring people unto God by yourself, you're going to end up falling along with them. You notice, I'm going to show you something in this scripture that shows you there's a right way to fish and there's a wrong way to fish. Jesus told his disciples, throw the net on the right because they were fishing their way, not his way. They were catching men the way that they thought they need to catch men. Jesus showed them the right way to catch but when morning was come, verse 4, Jesus stood on the shore, and the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, children, children, I don't care how learned you get in the word of God, you are still a child in the word of God. You never know as much as God knows. You, every single time you read this Bible, when you read this very chapter over again, I guarantee you, you're going to learn something new. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're still a child. You're not going to learn completely everything. Jesus said unto his disciples, Children, have you any meat? How much of the word of God do you know? Do you have any meat? See, because we think we're only supposed to learn a little bit. You're supposed to learn all of it in its entirety. 
You think you only want to learn part of the Bible that you want to learn and don't want to learn the whole part? You only want to learn what sounds good to you? That's not meat. You're supposed to learn what hurts your feelings too. That's meat. Paul told people, he said, hey, for one, uh, when you first came, I was feeding y'all with milk because you was like babies. But now, since you've grown in your Christianity, I'm going to feed you some meat. I'm going to tell you what God really says. And they said, no. And Jesus said unto them, you're doing it the wrong way. You're reading the word of God and you're only getting what you want to get out of it. Read the whole word of God. That's why I teach you guys, if you, even if you leave First Southern Baptist Church, and go somewhere else to another church, you're mad at me, you're mad at the pastor, you're mad at somebody here, I ain't going to that church no more, you better make sure you go to a church that gives you some meat. Don't go to a church that just preach what you want to hear, because I'm going to preach the truth. And if it hurts your feelings, take it up with God. Don't come in here with feelings. See, because if you get offended by the word of God, then the spirit of God is not in you. See, because I know I'm not perfect. And when I stand here and the word of God crucify you, it crucifies me also. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship. And there you'll find. Go out there and preach in the, word, preach in the name of God. Go out there and do what God say do. And you're going to find. They cast therefore. And now we're not able to draw in for the multitude of fishes. Now, all of us. Some of you don't have a mouth as big as mine. You can't go out there preaching like I can. <laughs> huh? But you can live the word of God. You can do the work of God. Even if you can't speak the word of God, you can do it. And you're still going to draw people by the things that you do. A multitude of fishes. There's a multitude of fish come over here every day to stand in that child line. You know why? Because you have drawn them here by your work that you do. Catching fish. Catching fish. Verse 7, John 21. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he got up and put his clothes on because Simon was out there fishing in the new. <laughs> wasn't nothing around but men so he, <laughs> Simon was with the boys and letting the boys hang out <laughs> God got a sense of humor boy for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea and the other disciples came in a little ship for they were not far from land but as it were, 200 cubits dragging the net with the fishes. And as soon as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. Now here it is, the Lord, we know who the Lord is. The Lord don't need nobody to go out and get nobody for him. He go get his own if he wants. But he gives us, he asks us to obey him. To show people in our lives the difference that he's made in our lives. Even your own close relatives. They don't want to believe how God's working in your life. God says show them anyway. He don't need you to show them, but God says show them anyway. Here it is, the disciples came to the, to the shore and Jesus already standing over there cooking fish. <laughs> and they ain't seen him out in the boat, but he's already standing. He's already caught people. 
All the miracles he did, he already caught people. But look what he said there. Bring me the fish that you caught. Bring me the ones that you caught. Now, God don't tell us to go out there and take a baseball bat or a two by four and beat nobody over the head and tell them about him. That's not how you catch God. That's not how you catch people. God say live a godly life. Do a godly work. That's how you catch people. Love one another. Forgive one another. That's how you catch people. God will do the rest. God will do the rest. God says, show me the fish that you caught. How do you catch people? Forgive your enemy. Love your enemy. Do a kind work for your enemy. That's how you catch people. God says, show me how you did that. Show me, did you do that? Show me how you did that. Simon went up and drew the net to the land. Full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet the net wasn't broke. You can never do too much work for God. Never. Never. Scripture says the young will faint. Those that want to give up, they'll, they'll give up. But we, we're not to. We're not to. Verse 12. John 21. Jesus said unto them, come and die. Jesus says, any man that comes unto me that opens that door, I will come in and I will sit down and I will sup with him. Come. You're here dining with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ now. And he, you, you will never be full. You will never be full. Because as long as you come to him, he's going to sit and talk with you and feed you spiritually as much as you need. Why do you think he came back and walked around with his disciples those 40 days? Even though they had been walking with our Lord and walked with him all the way to the cross, they still needed to be fed. They still, he had to come back and tell them what they were going to suffer, what they were going to go through for following him, how they were going to be persecuted, and they, that they needed to hold on. He had to come back and tell them that. Because they, what happened? When they, hung, when they crucified Jesus Christ, they all scattered. Remember? They all scattered. Mary Magdalene had to tell them to come back together in the upper prayer room. They all scattered. Because the Bible says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. That's exactly what happened. He had to come back and tell them, don't give up. I'm going to show you something that he's going to tell Peter in this chapter. Something very powerful He's going to tell Peter. Now, we all know Peter. Peter was a big mouth. Peter run around. Peter would, remember Peter grabbed that sword in the garden. Peter wanted to fight. No, you ain't taking my Lord. That's Peter. But watch what happened in this chapter, though. Verse 13. Now, verse 12. Jesus said unto them, come and die. And none of his disciples dared to ask him, who are you? None of his disciples. When God calls you, you're coming, whether you want to go or not. They didn't dare ask him, who are you? What does it say, the next word? Knowing. Because when God calls you, you know. You know. I can't, I ain't got to tell you. Nobody's got to tell you. When God calls you, you know it's God that's calling you. You know. No, you didn't, they didn't dare ask, who are you? But they knew it was the Lord. 
as many of us get to a certain stages in our lives, when we get tired and we give up, God's calling you. Say, okay, Lord. I done tried it this way. I done tried it that way. Okay, Lord. You know. Then Jesus come forth and take bread and give it to them and fish likewise. Now, this is the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he had risen from the dead. Verse 15. (laughs) It's amazing how Jesus. You know what Jesus said to Simon? I'm going to change your name, that earthly name that you got, to Peter. Because Peter stood for rock. And he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. When he said that, he was meaning that we, as human beings, could look at how much how Peter denied Jesus Christ. And most of us denied God most of our lives. And we could see how God forgave Peter. And we could still go to God. Because God forgives us for denying him also. Look what happened to Peter. And he said, and when he had died, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon. He used his earthly name. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Do you love me more than anybody else that's serving me? Do you love God more than your mother, your father, your sister, your brother? Do you love God more than any laws that man going to give you? Peter said unto him, yes, Lord. You know that I love thee. Because Jesus knows all things. Peter knows that Jesus knows all things. One way that Peter knows is because he knows Jesus told him, you're going to deny me. So he knows Jesus knows already. He told Peter, you're going to deny me before it happened. The first two times Peter denied him, Peter didn't pay no attention. But the third time... When that cock crowed, Peter knew what Jesus had told him. He knew. He said, and if you love me, feed these sheep of mine. Feed my sheep with the word of God. Feed them. And he said unto him the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And and Peter said unto him, yes, Lord, you know that I love thee. And Jesus said unto Peter again, feed my sheep. And he said unto him the third time. Some of you already know where I'm going. How many times did did Peter deny Jesus Christ? How many times here has the Lord forgiven him? Three. He said, even though you denied me three times, I forgive you three times. Even though you denied me three times, I still can use you, Peter. I still can use you. You know, there's, there's times when people will get on their knees and pray and ask God, fix this problem in their life. And then they get up and God fix that problem. And then they still walk away. And they don't come back again until they got another problem. And God still will fix that problem. Still will fix that problem. And he said unto him, the third time, Simon, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter got, Peter got mad. 
He got upset. And he said unto him, the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. You love me? Then act like you love me. Show the world that you love me. Act like you're a Christian. You love Jesus? Show people that you love Jesus. This is what Jesus told Peter when you was young, before you came to me, before I forgave you, you did what you wanted to do. You did what you wanted to do. Everything you wanted to do, that's what you did. But there's a sacrifice. There's a cost of discipleship. He's telling Peter right here in this next verse, it costs you to serve me. When you was by yourself out there in the world, each and every one of us, we did what we wanted to do. But it's a sacrifice to serve Jesus Christ. First thing you got to do is kill off self. You got to kill off the world. The Bible teach you, you can't serve God and love the world too. Verse 18, Jesus is going to tell Peter what that cost is. Verily I say unto thee, when you were young, you did what you wanted to do and walked where you wanted to go. But now you're walking behind me. Now you've got to walk like me. But when thou shalt be old, You're going to walk like me, Peter. When you get old, they're going to stretch your hands out on that cross, Peter. They're going to stretch you out on that cross. When you was young, when you didn't have me, you did what you wanted to do. But now, Peter, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall dress you. And carry you where they want to carry you. Straight to the grave, Peter. Straight to the grave. Because if you remember, Peter got crucified just like Jesus Christ. Peter got crucified too. And Jesus told him, it's a cost, Peter, to serve me. But he's, he told Peter, don't run from it. Don't run from it. Th this he spoke signifying... By what death that Peter was going to glorify God. Because if you remember, Peter told Jesus Christ, I'll follow you, Lord, all the way to the grave. And Christ told Peter, surely you will, Peter. Surely you will. Peter didn't know he was predicting his own death. And here the Lord told it. The Lord told him. God tells us, and God predicts each and every one of our deaths. If you don't die in this life, you will die in the next one. But when you die in this life and come to life in Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. You don't die again. Then spoke Jesus, signifying by what death that he should glorify God. And when he had thus spoken this, he said unto him, follow me, Peter. Don't give up, Peter. They're going to crucify you. Follow me. Walk the same death that I walk. Follow me. Then Peter went back in the flesh, <laughs> turned around, and he saw John. He saw that disciple that Jesus loved. And he said, well, okay, Lord, well, what's going to happen to him? You told me how I'm going to die. What's going to happen to him? And Jesus told, told Peter, don't worry about him. You follow me. If I want him to live till I get back, don't worry about it. But you follow me. See, sometimes we get too busy worrying about what somebody, how somebody else walking, their Christian walk. 
Who are you to crucify with their, their relationship with God? Worry about what does, what does Paul tell you? Work out your own salvation. Don't worry about how somebody else is walking their Christian walk. Work out your own salvation. Christ told Peter, don't worry about John. You follow me. Christ said, if I want him to live till I come back, that ain't got nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with you. Verse 22, and Jesus said unto him, if I, will, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is it that of thee? What has it got to do with you? But you follow me. This saying went abroad. Then they're going to start a rumor. Then they're going to start a rumor talking about Jesus say John wasn't going to never die. <laughs> Jesus say, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. He said, if I want him not to die, he won't die. He didn't say, I said, I said he wasn't going to die. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciples should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but that if he will, that he will tarry till I come. What is it to thee? See what it got to do with you. Verse 24. This is the disciple, John, that testified of these things and wrote, this thing, wrote these things. And we know that John's testimony is true. How do you know John's testimony is true? Because John wrote the book of Revelation. John wrote the book of Revelation. That's how you know his testimony is true. And John was the only one of the disciples that died of natural death. All of the other, John lived to be an old man. He's the only disciple that did not die a martyr. Some of them had their skin peeled off. Some of them were hung. They were beat to death. John is the only one that lived their entire life. And there are also many other things Jesus did that which they could not be written, every one. I suppose that even the world, if, could not contain the books that should be written. If everything that Jesus had done was written down, we would never finish reading that book. That's what he's saying. We would never finish reading that book. Speaking of the testimony of John, John saw an amazing sight to go to heaven and to write the book of Revelation. Man, John saw an amazing sight. And he wrote about it. And his testimony is true. But do you know John also saw something that we didn't see? in the book of Revelation because there's one chapter in the book of Revelation where that angel told John, you could see it, but see that you don't write about it. I don't know what, I, we, I don't know what it is. The angel told John, you could see it, but these things, right not. John saw it. And John brings us closer to creation also. John brings us, in the book of Genesis, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. When John went, in the book of Revelation, when John went to heaven, John found out the same thing. Because if you notice, John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And 1 John 1, 1 says the same exact thing. So John's testimony is true. I pray God has blessed you. I pray he opened your eyes to some things. 
help you grow in your relationship with him, the important thing is that you have one with him. My relationship with Jesus Christ ain't going to save you one bit. Got to get your own. Huh? <laughs> no collective salvation. The Bible says there's no ransom for your brother. So that means my salvation ain't going to save nobody. <laughs> I got to take that ransom that Jesus Christ has paid for me for myself. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for that salvation that's freely given to us through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If there's anyone without that salvation, Lord, in the sound of my voice, I pray they would invite you in to their heart and into their life in this day. Walk with us now, Lord. Talk with us, teach us, and guide us. All these things I pray for in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. You guys take a break.